Ladies and gentlemen of the Shred Gaming Telecom video, we're going to be discussing high bandwidth memory. High bandwidth memory, of course, is going to be the uh, memory technology that's featured in AMD's R9 300 series, specifically the high end, and variants of it, of course, are also going to creep into NVIDIA's technology as well. But what is it? Why do we need it? And how important is it for performance? Is it a bit of a buzzword or not? Well, no. Uh, AMD have actually released a series of slides and they demonstrate their reasoning behind actually going ahead and creating this technology with uh, SK Hynix. So without further ado, let's jump into it. This is also an article, by the way, which is linked in the video description if you want access to all of the slides um, and more text and all of that stuff. So anyway, GDDR5 right now is hitting what AMD considers to be a wall. GPUs continue to become more powerful year after year, iteration after iteration, clock speeds increase, shaders increase, and so on. But there's only so much you can do with GDDR5. A couple of reasons behind this. One, they take up a lot of die space, uh, sorry, space on the PCB. Two, they're not very voltage efficient. And three, even with all of that said, let's say you're running a 512-bit interface with 1500 megahertz memory, you're still only looking at just under 400 gigabytes per second, 384 gigabytes per second to be precise. With 1750, it goes up just over 400 gigabytes. It's still not enough, considering the levels of performance the next generation of GPUs are going to offer. So quite simply, a lot of board real estate is consumed with GDDR5. PCBs, of course, become much larger because of the amount of chips that are required, depending, obviously, on the bus width. For example, if you're going 256-bit bus, you're going to be looking at um, 8 uh, chips, which is quite a lot. On 16, if you're going with 512, it's a heck of a lot of space when one also considers the voltage regulators and all of the other bits and bobs which actually make this thing work. It makes the PCB larger, it increases the power consumption of the board, um, it also means that the, the cooler itself is going to be larger. And while you might not care about the, the actual board being big if you're running a high performance PC, it's still not an ideal situation, let's just be honest. Wouldn't you prefer smaller cards? Besides the fact that dual GPUs like, for example, R9295X2 or whatever uh, AM, uh, NVIDIA's equivalent is going to be like the dual Titan, you know, it has to be so bloody huge because of all of the number of uh, chips on the on the thing. Of course, lower TDP is also nice as well. If the actual GPU requires less wattage, it means that you're not going to have like a thermal reactor to power the bloody thing. Of course, some of this does come down to the actual chip itself, in other words, the GPU, but memory doesn't help matters, and let's discuss that, shall we? So, what is an interposer? Because that's a bit critical. An interposer, at its heart, is just a set of wires. The chip, the GPU, or the CPU, or the APU, or whatever, will sit uh, at one side, and then you've got the DRAM, um, the stacked high bandwidth memory sitting around it or to the side of it or whatever. Now this means that it's as close as possible to the chip and then it's going to be communicating with the chip with hundreds of wires. Now effectively speaking this connection for the 300 series is going to be a 2.5D die because the chips are not stacked on top of the uh, GPU. The memory chips, however, are stacked on top of one another, and they're interconnect using a technology known as TSV, also known as through silicon bias. You can we could talk about this in very in-depth technical details, but essentially all it is is just a connection for each of the, uh, the chips to actually know what the other one is talking about, and of course to directly communicate with the actual GPU itself. SK Helix, along with AMD, worked together to create specifications for this for high bandwidth memory, and I was actually told on a phone call with AMD that they would managed to keep most of the details of the next generation G GPU under wraps, but the one thing they couldn't was the high bandwidth memory specifications and some of the details, simply because, at the end of the day, they were going through approval processes, so obviously some of this stuff is simply going to leak out. There's nothing they could really do about it. HBM, however, is very, very different from how it operates from GDDR5. 
GDDR5, each per package, um, GDDR5 part, runs at 32 bits, whereas on the other hand, uh, HBM is running at 1024 bit, and this is obviously bus width. That's a huge difference, and you might scratch your head when I'm about to tell you that the clock speed of HBM is only 500 MHz compared to 1750. Now the reason behind this is so that voltage can be considerably lower and instead its throughput is pure bus width. So while GDDR5 primarily works on speed and obviously they have to stick tons of these things on a PCB, for example they might put in oh, 08 if they're running a 256 bit bus or 16 for 512, instead um, a GDDR5 memory running at 1750 MHz puts out just about 28 gigabytes. Per sec gigabytes per second per chip, whereas HBM is 100 gigabytes per chip. This is obviously considerably more efficient, a lot more efficient. It takes up considerably less die space as well. There have been an absolute myriad of rumours that the PCB of the R9 390X or whatever the hell that highest end part will be called will be much smaller than the R9 290X, and AMD have basically confirmed this. Um, there's an actual slide which reads that a um, R9 290X footprint is 9,900mm uh, squared, whereas on the other hand it's half that, literally half, for what they're calling a PCB footprint for HBM based ASIC. Obviously they're not saying what it is, but it just gives you an indication of how much smaller the PCB could actually potentially be. This is huge because we're going to be getting around three times the performance per watt than GDDR5. And considering that we're going to also be on the lookout for smaller PCBs, um, all of this is boding really well, of course, for mobile or smaller form factors. But not just for smaller form factors. Intel um, naturally are interested in the technology, and, in and NVIDIA, of course, are loving it because they're going to be using HBM2 for Pascal. Pascal, by the way, will have an astounding one terabyte per second of memory bandwidth. Who knows what next generation AMD GPUs are going to have. Supposedly, it's also going to be uh, HBM2 as well. That's obviously the Arctic Island GPUs, not the 300 series in Fiji. Considering that the 390X itself has 4096 shaders running at a clock speed very similar to that of the 290X, which has 2816 shaders, it's, it's a good indication of where GPUs are going. Quite simply put, GPU and GPU technology is not stalling. It's going to continue to rise. The R9 390X, or whatever it ends up being called, is going to have around 8.5 to 9 teaflops of computing performance, and it's not going to stall. We're already seeing die shrinks from 28nm to 4 to 16nm, which is going to be happening over the next 12 months or so, which, when that happens, they're saying about 40% extra uh, performance or 50% less power utilization. This has been confirmed basically by TSMC. Just think of that, just for a second, and just think of what that could potentially mean. There's no point in having ridiculously powerful GPUs if you can't feed them. It's that simple. Um, and I know I always use this example, but the original GeForce, when it was released, it was just a bit ill-timed because SDR memory was the rage. There was very little DDR memories is back when DDR1 was a thing. And a lot of a lot of gamers just looked at the GeForce and said, you know, it's awesome, it's got a, you know hardware TNL and all of this stuff, but in terms of raw performance, it wasn't that much ahead of the TNT2. And the reason behind it was DDR uh, SDR memory was the standard. DDR memory was extremely expensive to produce, it was very rare. And it wasn't just um, NVIDIA that had the problem, to be fair, all of the manufacturers at the time did. 
but Nvidia's timing probably was the worst out of all of them because their design was also a little bit less memory efficient. Successive designs such as the GeForce 2 of course fixed a lot of these problems but even when Nvidia went from SDR to DDR um, for their original GeForce design performance went up quite considerably and it's just an indication that memory bandwidth can make a huge difference considering that one gigabyte of GDDR5 memory is 24mm by 28mm compared to 5mm by 7mm of the very same amount of uh, HBM memory, one gigabyte, that's 94% less surface area, which is massive. And it's absolutely ridiculous. And it's, to me, very, very exciting. I'm not necessarily saying that the GPUs now the 300 series are going to 110% need every scrap of memory bandwidth because we just don't know until we're testing them. But I can tell you one thing, in my mind it's really good that these technologies are coming out because, you know, just like PCs with DDR3, memory bandwidth of course on desktops is becoming a bit of a problem, that's one of the reasons we're switching to DDR4, but um, you know, HBM, the memory bandwidth potential is absolutely ridiculous. When we switch to HBM2, we're going to be at, as I said, you know, GPUs of around one terabyte per second. And considering that the average GPU now has around 300 ish uh, gigabytes per second memory bandwidth, obviously it does depend on the manufacturer, the range, you know, what's the price range of the GPU, the architecture, and so on. It gives you an indication of where we're going. But Hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.